Okay. YouTube is good. Facebook looks good as well. Or actually, that was a little short one, it does. All right, now it looks like we're good. Looks like we're running smoothly on Facebook and YouTube. And welcome to this Friday edition of Walking Through History. Thank you for joining us on this good Friday afternoon. My name is Nick Angel, and joining me uh, here on our study is my good friend and brother, Alan Seamistrang. We are thankful to be studying with you today from Numbers 13 and 14. We are getting into, or we are in the middle of the, the narrative that we found within Numbers where the children of Israel have been making their, their way from Egypt, and now they are on the doorstep of the promised land, of the land of Canaan that God swore to their father Abraham that they would inherit as a people. God is, is making good on his promise, but what we're going to see here is a lack of faith and trust on, on the behalf of the people and the unfortunate consequences that come as a result of that. That's what we're going to be looking at today in Numbers 13 and 14. And of course, this is just the continual continued pattern of the behavior that we see from the people of Israel. They are, and unfortunately they could be defined as a people, as, as a people that complain a lot. They are unfaithful in many respects. They don't trust that God is going to do exactly as he has said he would, he would do. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to read through the text of Numbers 13 and 14 and have some good discussion about what we find here in this text and, and, and see how it can help us to be faithful people of God. Alan, it is good to have you as always. Friends, hope that you are doing well today. Doing real good. I, I was excited. I got to watch some football last night. So that was hey, kind of cool, right? Uh, that, that felt a little a little strange, but felt something something felt a little bit right there. Yeah, I know I, I just completely forgot that last Saturday was the first Saturday of like a number of football games. The previous Saturday we were in Florida and I was able to catch a, a couple of games. I think one was Friday night, and there was one on Saturday as well. But then last Saturday, there was more football. And this Saturday, there's going to be even more football. I think the Big 12 is getting kicked off this Saturday. And then uh, two weeks from tomorrow, I think it's two weeks. Say, from SEC is not for two Yeah, two weeks, weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. Yeah, my Tennessee Vols, they get they get going. They'll be in South Carolina, hopefully. <laughs> uh, COVID, COVID permitting. <laughs> They'll be playing uh, at South Carolina in Columbia. And I'm excited for that. I'll actually be in East Tennessee on that Saturday. My sister has a wedding shower that we're going to be over there for. So we're going, going to be doing a little more traveling at the end of this month and in into next month. But uh, it's fun today, to get some choices right now. We got, I think, same day we got football, basketball, yeah. hey, I, baseball, you, hockey. Cool. I mean, you get your choice there. For, for having been sportsless, at least live sportsless for uh, so long, I, I guess it's a little bit of a little bit of redemption to have the smorgasbord of, of sports that we have going on right now. It just makes it difficult to try to pick what to watch. Actually, it does. It's not difficult at all. I'm watching football. I mean, kind of <laughs> reminds me of kind of reminds me of the quail we we read about last chapter. Yeah, there's just so yeah, many. You don't they're know complaining you're about not having enough meat, yeah. and you know, <laughs> Lord gives them more than they need. And so. That's right. Well, I definitely don't think I'm going to find find it contemptible in my own eyes. I'm definitely not going to become <laughs> that's true. That's true. Sports. That's that's for sure. All right. Well, we are in Numbers 13. Thank you for those who are joining with us. Uh, just real quick, too, as well. Before we begin, we're going to starting next week. We're going to cut down the shows for noon two a week to just the one on Tuesday. We're doing that just because things are getting back to normal. We're going to have some more responsibilities that we haven't had over the past few weeks or past few months coming back up. Uh, so it's going to give us a little more time to to deal with those things. It's going to give us um, time to to devote to other studies, 
I know for myself, I'm, I'm taking a few classes online, some religious classes. So I'll give me some more time for that as well. Uh, there's only so much time. I wish that we could, could just do everything full go. But again, there's only so much time. We not only want to give proper time to, to each of our studies that we're participating in, but we also want to have time for being dads and being husbands and, and, uh, and being friends with other people and spending time. So just to try to do our best to balance all, all the different responsibilities that we have. So our next week we'll be going down to just a show on Tuesday. So hope that you'll keep that in mind. If you don't see us on Fridays, not doing that anymore. Catch us on Tuesdays. We'll be here going, going, uh, going consistently on Tuesdays from here on out. So just keep that in mind. Numbers 13 is the text that we are in today. Numbers chapter 13. Hope that you will join us there. If you don't have a Bible on you, no worries. We're going to have the text on the screen. You are more than welcome to join us reading uh, on the screen. Numbers 13, reading from the Christian Standard Bible. The text says that the Lord spoke to Moses. And this is what he said. He said, send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I'm giving to the Israelites, send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. Moses sent from, sent them from the wilderness of Paran into, or at the Lord's command, and all the men were leaders in Israel. And these were their names. The first one being Shamua, son of Zakur, from the tribe of Reuben. Shaphat, son of Horai, from the tribe of Simeon. Caleb, son of Jephunneh, Je- Je- from the tribe of Judah. Egal, son of Joseph, from the tribe of Issachar. Hoshea, son of Nun, from the tribe of Ephraim. Paltai, son of Raphu, from the tribe of Benjamin. Gadiel, son of Sodai, from the tribe of Zebulun. Gadai, son of Suzai, from the tribe of Manasseh, in parentheses, from the tribe of Joseph. Amiel, son of Gamali, from the tribe of Dan. Sether, son of Michael, from the tribe of Asher. We, why can't we have more Michaels in here, Alan? It'd be a lot more easy to read <laughs> for us. Uh, Nabai, son of uh, Vofsi, from the tribe of Naphtali. And Guel, from, uh, son of Machai, from the tribe of Gad. And I really read all of those just to highlight verse number eight, because these were the names of the men Moses sent to scout out the land. And Moses renamed Hosh- uh, Hoshea, son of Nun, Joshua. Uh, again, I read that just just to to really emphasize that these men were leaders. Now, there have been previous leaders that have been chosen from the children of Israel. I think back to our last uh, last uh, lesson, Alan, our last study, where the seventy elders were appointed from the tribes to come out and to to help Moses with the load. And and if I had to differentiate it all between those men and these men, I would have to say probably the, the difference between those men and these men and these men would probably be more. I won't say they necessarily have to be younger, but they have to probably be more able-bodied given the the responsibility that was laid at their shoulders to be able to go and to scout out this land, to be in the wilderness, to be able to fend for themselves. So that's probably the reason for the difference between that group of men and then this other group of men being uh, chosen. But Alan, as I mentioned, highlighted here is Hosea, the son of Nun from the tribe of Ephraim, the text tells us that he is he's renamed by Moses Joshua. Alan, what, what do we know about Joshua up to this point? And what do you think is the significance of Moses renaming this single man? At, at, to this point, we haven't seen much of Joshua. I mean, we recognize him right away, just knowing the, the rest of the story. But really, he's kind of been a, a, a minor character to this point. We know that he led... Uh, he led the people in the battle against the Amalekites uh, just days after exiting uh, exiting Egypt, and that was the scene where Moses uh, stood above, on, you know, on the hill, looking out over the battle. And when his arms were raised, they they proceeded to win. And when his arms fell, well, the Israelites started losing. So uh, so he had two men hold his arms up. But jo- uh, Joshua was was leading the army down on, on the field of battle there. And then Joshua seems to be uh, to become kind of a personal, almost like a, a, a secretary or personal assistant to uh, to Moses, uh, to the point where I mean he is the he is the one he's he's honored enough to uh, actually get to go up onto the mountain while Moses receives the law. He doesn't go all the way up, 
But uh, I mean, if, if Moses is at the top of the mountain and, you know, Joshua is halfway up and the rest of the people are on the bottom. So he gets that honored position there. Uh, he's separated from the people during the uh, Exodus 32 um, golden calf scene. Mm -hmm. And, and then later on, he's actually when, when God kind of uh, establishes a tent of meeting outside of the camp because of all that, instead of having the tent of meeting inside the camp, he separates himself from the people. Well, when Moses went to that tent of meeting, the Lord would come down, talk to with him face to face. But when Moses wasn't there, Joshua stayed there uh, the rest of the time. So he's actually, it, he's kind of interesting because it seems like he's, he's a leader, but he's also in a, in a separate position from the people. He's, he's apart from the people a lot. Uh, but uh, clearly he's connected with, uh, with Moses in a, very, uh, in a very intimate way because Moses uh, renames him. And, and we know just from other passages, other times that happens throughout the Bible, that that's uh, usually of some significance. It usually symbolizes a change in, in role or a change in some way. Think, you know, Abram to Abraham or from Saul to Paul. Uh, you have these uh, these men; their names get changed for for different reasons, and I, I I think the reason that this is here is because Joshua is going from maybe a minor a more minor leader. Uh, he's going to start uh, start to be established as a as a greater leader uh, to the point that he becomes the successor of Moses um, later on. Obviously, he he's the one that takes over after Moses dies and and leads the people into Egypt. And, and then we'll see Caleb also uh, kind of taking a leadership role as well. And, and you, you bemoan the fact that these names are so hard. Well, it's a good thing. We might as well use hard names on these guys because besides Caleb and Joshua, you, you don't want to name your kids after these guys. So oh. <laughs> we, we wouldn't want to waste a good name on, on these other 10. No, you definitely would not because they are not long for this world. I <laughs> consider yep. what we're going to see here in a few moments. The only thing I'd add on to that is that it just seems, uh, it seems like there's almost a, a father-son relationship mm -hmm. here between Moses and, and Joshua. The fact that he would rename him, well, you wouldn't rename someone unless, as you as you mentioned, there is a very intimate relationship that you have with them. And that seems to certainly be the case here between Moses and Joshua. Well, after he one, has- One ahead. kind of, you know, side note, uh, uh, Hosea, there's, uh, it's, it's only one to, for us, it's one letter different. And it's very, very similar name, kind of like how Saul and Paul are, mm -hmm. you know, kind of similar names. Um, the, the, the big, the big difference, I think Hosea means he saves. And then Joshua is uh, like the Lord saves is the meaning behind that. And um, okay, yeah, I think Joshua is really the Hebrew name that we would in greek we would say jesus yes so yes. jesus and joshua are basically the same name just in two different languages just like we would say john and ivan in russian or jose and you know jose in spanish they're the same name just in their in their separate language yeah and in biblical languages i think there is a a lot of a lot of um common ground between like J's and Y's mm -hmm. that, and a lot of times the J is pronounced with a, with a Y sound, uh, which is why a number of people, whenever they refer to Jesus, uh, they, they refer to him as Yeshua. That sort of his Hebrew name, if I remember correctly from something I read somewhere, which sounds very much just like Joshua. Verse 17, we get into what these men were chosen for. Again, we're highlighting, Caleb and Joshua, they're going to, if you were familiar with the story, they're going to end up being the good guys in the story. Let's read exactly what they were supposed to do. We read in verse number 17 that when Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan, he told them, go up this way to the Negev and then go up into the hill country, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Is the land they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications? Is the land fertile or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? Be courageous. I think that's a key right there. Maybe some foreshadowing to what we're going to see. Be courageous and bring back some fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they being the ones that have been handpicked from each individual tribe, each of these, these uh, leaders, they went up 
and scouted out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rahab near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, uh, where Ahimin, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were living. Hebron was there seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And when they came to the valley of Eshcol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which was carried by a pole by two men. They also took some pomegranates and figs, and that place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the grapes, because of the, because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. And after the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting out the land. The mission of this mission, the purpose of this mission, was very simple. It, it was reconnaissance. They were to to go and gather gather intel and gather some some detail concerning what this land was about. Not just the land itself, whether it was uh, whether it was a productive land or whether it was a barren land, uh, but to consider the people. What were the people like? Because you have to remember they're going into this land to take it over, to take possession of it. And in order to do that, if there are already people inhabiting it, then they're going to have to kick out those people. They're going to have to overtake them. And Moses' is, is idea is for them to go and just to scout it out, see what they were up against. And what we see, Alan, is that it is... The question was, in verse 20, is the land fertile or unproductive? Well, based upon what we see from verses 21 through 25 on, this is a pretty awesome place. And the descriptions that we have here, the fruit that they found within this land, uh, was certainly very inviting. It's something that, that you would think they would have been very excited to pursue, to go into this land and take possession of it. But what we see instead of there being an excitement, instead of them being, all right, this place is great. We need to go into it. We need to take possession of it. It is everything that the Lord had promised it would be. Instead of that, verse 26 says that the men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness of Paran at Kedesh. They brought back a report for them and the whole community, and they showed from the fruit, they showed them the fruit of the land. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of, the, of its fruit. However, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of the Negev. The Hethites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, Let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. We see confidence and courage that Moses had, had told them to have. We see that displayed here within Caleb. But the men, the other men, the other 10 men, uh, and we, we know that Joshua was included in this because later on that's going to be specified. These other 10 men who had gone up with him, so they went to the same place. They saw the same things. They said, we can't attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they scouted. The land we pass through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak of, of come from, from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers, and we must have seen the same to them. The report here, Alan, is described as negative, and it, and it really sets, us, sets up here a, a strong con contrast between the way and then again, they both saw the same land. They both saw the very large people. They both saw they, their strength. They saw the fortification of the cities. They even saw the fruit of the land. And yet they looked at them with, with two different conclusions. The larger group said, it's great, but we can't take it. We're not strong enough. Whereas Caleb says, no, we need to go up now. We don't need to wait. Let's go up and take this land. Alan, what do you think about, about these two these Two groups, 10 versus two, these 10 groups seeing the same thing and yet coming to completely different conclusions. I've always kind of wondered myself, why did they, why did they scout out the land? And, uh, you know, there are some questions there because it, it doesn't actually say that the Lord commanded them to scout out the land. It was Moses. Um, now to say that uh, Moses was doing this against the Lord's will. Uh, there's no evidence to support that at all. But it's interesting that uh, that it's Moses that commands this. 
Uh, and I think the reason for this is not because there was uh, any doubt of of the goodness of the land, you know, that it is indeed flowing with milk and honey. But I think, uh, you know, if Moses kind of came up with this idea himself, this is to give them confidence. I mean, the Lord's been telling them, I'm going to bring you up to this land. It flows with milk and honey. It's where the Jebusites and the Amorites, he's been telling them all these details about this land. Well, wouldn't that be a great thing for them to send some spies in and they come back and, you know, they confirm that all of those details are true. That And they, that's what they do in verse 27. Uh, we went into the land. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. So, well, I mean, one thing that the Lord has told them is true. They've just confirmed it with their own eyes. Ten, twelve witnesses can can attest to that. So if, you know, this one thing that the that the Lord has said is true, why not the rest of the things that the Lord said is true? And that's where it, you know, it starts to uh, diverge. You have, you know, the two, Joshua and Caleb, having one opinion uh, versus the, the ten others. And and you can tell just by the uh, the things that are reported about the land, what they're worried about. Um, starting in verse 28, the people living in the land are strong. Their cities are large and fortified. I, I, I don't know if they just assume that they were kind of wandering, uh, you know, like when they, they defeated the Amalekites before. Well, that was, they didn't really have cities, those, those peoples. There was more kind of like wandering groups. So they, maybe they thought that it would be just simple, you know, caravans of people that they could easily defeat. Well, turns out there are, you know, large, well-established cities there. And of course, you know, what do they highlight about these, about these people there? It's the strongest of the people, and that's the, uh, the son descendants of Anak. And they even, I think they kind of use a little bit of uh, hyperbole. They're exaggerating here. I mean, we saw these men in uh, verse 32, it uh, devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw are of great size. <laughs> all the people we saw in it are men of great size. Uh, well, surely not all of them are giants descended from, you know, this one family that- All of them, every single- All, all of them, you know, oh. are, are giants. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there were some giants there, the descendants of Anak, and they they compare these to the, the Nephilim. Uh, we know, you know, when we studied back in Genesis six, that's where the Nephilim are first discussed. And it seems those were these, you know, great mighty men of old. They had, um, they were either, you know, giants, you know, larger than life type guys, or they were just, you know, powerful Kings, whatever they were, they were kind of uh, mytho mythology, mythologized, whatever that word is. Uh, they were, they were, you know, they, they were idolized. They were made bigger than, than even perhaps they were. And, and of course they couldn't be the descendants of those men because that was all before the flood. So unless they survived the flood and another group came after them, I mean, they're, what they're saying is these are descended from the giants, just like we might say, uh, you know, this great, these great men were descended from the gods. You know, we're not talking, you know, actually we're talking kind of hyperbole. hyperbole. Well, I mean, that all this language that they're using is, you know they're exaggerating. They're 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 making it seem worse than than perhaps it is. I have no doubt that they had strong cities, and that's something you can say. But uh, they're clearly trying to scare the people and you know make it seem worse worse than it is. First off, and then two, obviously, you know they they've decided that they cannot. Uh, we cannot attack. They are stronger than we. They've for completely forgotten the fact that they have they have the Lord on their side. So, yeah, I mean, one Canaanite versus one Israelite. Canaanite's probably going to win. All you know, everything, nothing else considered. But when you have God on your side, well, clearly that's going to be the uh, the X factor that brings them over the top. But uh, they they reject that. They don't think that God is strong enough to take these. Uh, take these cities and take these people and defeat this uh, and conquer this land, even though they've already received, you know, partial evidence that what God says comes, comes, comes true. He's already defeated the greatest, uh, the greatest king and greatest military, the Egyptians once. So, I mean, what do these, you know, little, uh, little hill country cities, what do they, what chance do they have? Well, 
they still bring a negative report and and convince the people to turn back. And I, th I think what you said there at the end is really the the crux of the issue. It, it isn't so much the people themselves that they're going up against. It's the fact that they've forgotten God. Um, I probably see this as, as them being, I don't necessarily see them exaggerating the, their case here. I don't see them exaggerating their, the case as far as the power of the people. What I see here is a, more of a negative thing towards God. It's not necessarily that these people are just so much stronger, but they, they're not considering the fact that God is with them, just as you said. And I wanted, I wanted us to remember that as they were coming out of Egypt, they had an opportunity, opportunity to take one particular route, which would have led them through territories of other people. Yet in Exodus 13 and verse 17, the Lord says they're not ready for that yet. They're not ready for war. They're not ready for this great battle. Therefore, I'm going to take them a different way. They, they couldn't handle it. That's prior, I believe, to God showing his power over Pharaoh in the parting of the Red Sea and then the, the destruction of Pharaoh and his entire army in Exodus 13. But now I want to see the change between where they were then and what's transpired since then. And now we have Caleb who has this confidence. He says, let's go up now, verse 30, and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. He says, we've seen God. We've seen his power. We, we know exactly what he is capable of. Why in the world would we not go up at this point and take it? We have everything on our side. So he sees God for what God is. He sees God appropriately. I think these other men, they don't see God appropriately. They don't see God appropriately. And I, I take that for the fact that once we get into the next text, Caleb and Joshua and Moses, God, none of them discount the report. None of them say, listen, it's not really that bad. They're not focused on the people at all. They're completely focused on God. And what you were saying about the, the Nephilim back in, in, in Genesis 4, it actually says something there that I never caught before. What it says in Genesis 4 is that during those days they lived and afterwards. My question is how? It was like you believe they, that they were wiped out. So the only thing I could think is there's two possibilities at that point. Either some of those genes were in the wives of, of Noah's wives, that, that's, or excuse me, Noah's, Noah's son's wives. The genes were in them. That's the only thing I think of. Or that whatever the, the sin that was committed prior to the flood was carried out again after the flood, which resulted in, in the Nephilim. Uh, that's the only two, two ways I can, I can understand them being present. Yet that text does say they were present then and afterwards. Here they are saying, these are the descendants of the Nephilim, the, the, the descendants of Anak, which are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapters, I think, two. And they're also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter nine. Uh, and actually there in Deuteronomy nine, Moses says something uh, specifically about them. Deuteronomy chapter nine and verses one and two. He says, uh, uh, da, 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 da. so this is <laughs> so this is actually the next time they're, gonna, they're getting ready to cross. So they have this time where we're going to read in just a moment where they're not able to cross because of their unfaithfulness and distrust. And this next time after they've wandered and they're getting ready to cross, uh, Moses says, listen, Israel, today you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and drive out nations greater and stronger than you. So there again, I think, is an affirmation of what they're, what he, what they're saying. These people are greater and stronger than us. They just are. Uh, with large cities fortified to the heavens, the people are strong and tall. The descendants of the, the Anakim, which are the same people we're talking about here, you know about them and you have heard it said about them. Who can stand up uh, to the sons of Anak? So these are mighty strong people. But they have forgotten how mighty and strong their God is. And then that makes me, again, if we're trying to draw some conclusions to ourselves, um, we don't have to discount and undersell the difficulties we're going through in order to understand the strength of our God. What I mean by that is the reality is we go through some difficult times right now. We, for the past five, six months, we have been going through difficult times. And yet in order to, to show the strength of God to help us get through those times, we don't have to undersell them. We don't have to act like it hasn't been difficult. Let's be honest. They have been difficult. They've been tough. They've been discouraging. The strongest among us have been discouraged at times over the past six months. And yet 
when those struggles have been difficult to me, that just highlights how, how strong our God is and the fact that he has, has gotten us through those and that he will continue to get, get us through the difficult times. Here, they didn't have to undersell the, the people of the lands. They were strong. They were mighty. They were that way, I think, here in Numbers, in numbers uh, 13 and 14. They're going to be that same way in Deuteronomy. And all that does is highlight how strong their God is. Their, their focus was on the wrong, wrong thing. As the saying goes, don't worry about how big and difficult the storm is. Remember how big and strong your God is who helps you get through the storm. That, to me, is, is what they're missing here. They're just focused on the wrong thing. They don't have to undersell. They can be honest. Yes, these were strong people, but they needed to be more honest about who their God was. Does that make sense, Alan? Is that coming across clearly? Hopefully those who are listening, and that, that makes sense to them as well. You mentioned uh, right after they left Egypt, uh, you know, they had kind of two paths they could have gone, and it mentions they could have gone the quickest way up to uh, the land of Israel, which was by the sea which would have led them through some of this more difficult country. And like, like the Lord said, you know, lest they see war and turn back. So it's, it's interesting, you know, God, of course we believe God is able to do anything. Like if he really wanted to, he could have brought that people brought them up the way of the Philistines. And I mean, the land could have been conquered, you know, basically him, you know, completely guiding everything, you know, perfectly and, you know, not giving any options, but uh, the Lord works a little bit differently. He kind of works, uh, he works with what he has. He doesn't just, you know, make it happen in the same way. So he, he understood that this people needed some growing. Mm -hmm. Like, like, yeah, he could have, I mean, he could have had all the two-year-old babies and marched them out and he could have had them defeated <laughs> if he really wanted to. That's true. But that's, you know, that, that would be kind of weird and, and silly and, what would the, I mean, God does it in his own way. He uses his people, but he understands their, uh, there's growth that comes. Uh, so what, what did he do? He chose to send them around. He wanted them to, he saw it as more important for them to go and, you know, get the law, receive that, you know, learn it over the, you know, about a year, about a year and a half, really up to this point. And then come come up, you know, give them a year to grow. And you kind of see why, too, because, you know, if he had just like, hey, go up this way, um, you know, they probably would have gotten scared again and, and just like they did. So you understand why he did it that way. And I think it's uh, a little bit of mercy, too. God understanding like this people is these people have, lacks faith. So why would he just throw them into something too soon? Let's give them at least a chance to grow and, you know, see more of why they can trust in me. Uh, they can, I mean, they saw God on the mountain. They saw him. Uh, they even had an opportunity to uh, defeat and, you know, have victory in, in war already before this. Uh, so, you know, the, getting a little taste, you know, this, this group is, is growing until they come to the big, the big test here. Uh, but even then, this big test, even after a year, a year and a half of preparation and walking through the wilderness, they're still not ready. So, <laughs> so what does he do? He gives them another 40 years of preparation uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the right generation has, has grown up and, is, and that generation was the one that was able to conquer, uh, conquer the land. So this isn't uh, none of that is to say the Lord isn't capable of doing that, but he works within the abilities of his, uh, of his people and, uh, you know, understands their flaws and understands the best time for them to, uh, you know, gives them the best chance to succeed. And, but even then, you know, certain peoples like this generation will refuse to, they'll, they'll be hard. I mean, they're hard hearted. That's what, that's what it comes down to. There's, you know, not that the Lord can't, work with that and his his will be accomplished but uh you know he this is just how, how it ended up happening and uh it's to the detriment of this generation absolutely you would hope you would hope and, and actually the lord himself is going to make this argument here in just a few moments 
you would hope that they would trust in what they have seen, that they would take the abundance of evidence that has been shown to them concerning who God is, and they would come to the proper conclusion to trust in him and to just do as he says. But instead, they're giving evidence to the contrary, that they can't do it by these people. And it is this type of, of distrust. It is this type of unfaithfulness, uh, this lack of confidence that the people have, that, that these 10 have, that these 10 people have, which leads the people to where we find them in verse number one of chapter 14, numbers 14 and verse number one, then the whole community, the whole community broke out cries and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained, complained. We've seen that before. Here it is again, complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community told them, and we've, we've already heard this before as well. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader to go back to Egypt. Alan, come on. I mean, I mean this to me is just, it, it's mind boggling almost, but this isn't the, this is not the only time we've seen a proposed mutiny. In fact, we just saw it in the in the past chapter, did we not? It, this one does seem a little bit different. I, I don't know that any of the others, they were looking to appoint a new leader, which, you know, when you appoint a new leader, at least in this day and age, two things have happened. Either the previous one has died or you're going to kill the one that you have. So uh, you don't just, this isn't like today's today's day and age where, you know, we elect a new president, the other one steps aside and you know it's an easy transition of power that's not usually what happened back then so uh, so this language is is clearly I, I think even more threatening than uh, than some of the previous rebellions um, and later on we'll see Joshua and Caleb I mean they they equate it with rebellion verse 9 only don't rebel against the Lord so this is a full-on uh, more than the you know before I usually said grumbling or complaining uh, but Joshua and Caleb see this as a full-on just rebellion. You know, this I, I think this is, this is the pinnacle of all of the rebellion scenes that we've seen so far. This is clearly the worst one. I probably use the wrong word. Mutiny probably would be for the entire group trying to take the leader. I guess I should say a coup. A coup would maybe be what we saw in the previous chapter, chapter 12, mm -hmm. when Aaron kind of rise up against Moses and want to show themselves to be uh, – to be the important people within the group. So we have seen now this pattern of just difficulties against Moses. Chapter 11 was the people complaining against Moses and saying, we should have just died in Egypt. Chapter 12 is his other leadership, the leadership group, Miriam and, and Miriam and Aaron uh, rising up against him, probably Miriam more the ringleader of that and causing him trouble. Uh, chapter 13 is the spies who don't have confidence in, in what they have been seen here to do. And now chapter 14, the whole people say, you know what, let's just go back to Egypt. Let, let's get rid of this Moses guy. Let us, uh, let's get a new leader and let's go back to where we were. And here is the response of Moses and Aaron. Real quick, do you, you yeah, mentioned this. I mean, this is led, I think, by the 10 spies and we didn't quite, they're leaders. They're leaders. They're, they're leaders. And uh, like you mentioned, I think later on, Caleb says he was 40 years old. So uh, I don't think these are 80 year old leaders. These are kind of the, the middle that generation. Would be younger. That, that would younger. be younger. These were probably just because, I mean, Caleb's a warrior. Joshua's a warrior. I would assume the other 10 are the, I mean, think of this as like the generals of the army you know, the, the leaders of the army and the ones that can actually get out and fight, not just the, you know, an older right. general. Yeah. Usually this, I mean, even back then, I would assume that the, you know, as you got older, you wouldn't even be like a general, you would just retire. So the leaders of the army would have been in this kind of middle age group, you know, 30, 40, something like that. So this is a bigger threat because the ones leading this rebellion are the strongest uh, strongest and most powerful warriors that you have within Israel, at least from what I assume. So um, 
So, and it, even Joshua and Caleb, I mean, they understand that too. They're, they're pretty strong, but two against 10 and the two against 10 plus the rest of the people, yep. you know, that's, if they say that we are not strong enough to take this land, well, they're the, they're the warriors. They're the, they're the army. They should know better. So no wonder that people followed after, uh, after their leadership. If it's just some, you know, faithless old man that doesn't know any better, you know, why would you believe him? But these guys would know if we can take it or not. And to say not, you know, then we, ha we need to believe them. They put a lot of weight in, in what, in the, the, um, uh, uh, account of what they saw within there with, within the land and they took that account and they allowed them to to make the decision for them we, we can't go in there which is why they said well let's just go back to Egypt let's let's get another leader who's going to take us back to where we where we want to go so here is the response of Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb are also included here as well verses five to nine that Moses and Aaron fa fell face down in the front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephunneh, who were among those who scouted out the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. And, and everybody agrees upon that, I believe. Everybody, everybody agreed that the land itself was good. But they said their conclusion is different. They said, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land, into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord. Don't rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. For we will devour them. That's a that's a reversal of what was said earlier. The, mm -hmm. the spy said that this is a land that devours its inhabitants. Caleb and Joshua said, no, we will be the one that devours them when the Lord is on their side. He says their protection has been removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Again, they don't discount the account given by the spies. They don't say, no, the people aren't really that strong. No, they're not really that large. No, they're not giants. No, the cities aren't great. They said, we don't worry. we're not worried about that because we have the Lord on our side. You would hope, Alan, at this point, <laughs> the people would say, you know what? That's a really good argument. I, you know. Forgive us. We forgot about God for just a second. As awful as that would be itself, we forgot about God. But instead, the whole community threatens to stone them. <laughs> Even hearing this, the whole community threatened to stone them. But at this point, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of meeting. Even if they had forgotten about the Lord, the Lord says at this point, hey, that's enough. Don't forget I'm here. It's time for me to insert myself into this situation and establish the, the reality and the truth of what is actually going on here. What do you have to add to that, Alan? Uh, I just see so many, um, so many parallels with this, this group and their reaction to Joshua and Caleb and, you know, future groups of Israelites, specifically in the new Testament. I mean, how many times did Paul go around preaching truth, preaching the gospel and the, the Israelites of the city, tried to stone him and, and even Jesus himself I mean the same name as Joshua what did he come he came and said he said the same thing the Lord is with us of course he was saying I am with you uh, and what did they try to do he they tried to stone him several times they eventually kill him put him on you know on the cross and um and then, of course, you know, after they threatened the stone and then the glory of the Lord appeared, well, how much how much worse is it when that glory was already there? The man that they were, you know, they put on the cross, that's telling them all the, the same kind of thing, just trust in God, believe in God, obey God. He's telling them the same thing that Joshua and Caleb, in a sense, are saying here, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, believe in God and and you will be and you will win. That's what that Joshua was saying. That's what Jesus' message is. And, you know, what was the reaction of the first century Israelites? They, they killed that messenger. They tried to kill him. And That's what they're trying to hear. They're, yep. killing, they're killing the messenger who has brought the message they don't want to hear. It's really sad. But at this point, as we mentioned, God says, all right, it's time for me to get into this thing. It's time for me as being the judge of all things to, to allow you to know what is the reality of the matter. This is what the Lord says, beginning in verse 11. 
the Lord said to Moses, how long, how long will these people despise me? I want you to go through here. And what I've done is I've gone through this exit. I circled all the negative words of, of the response that these people have had towards God. There's the first one, despise. How long will these people despise me? How long will they note this, not trust me? Despite all the signs I have performed among them, I will strike them with a plague and destroy them. Then I will make you, he's speaking to Moses here, I believe. I will make you into a greater and mightier nation than they are. But Moses replied to the Lord, the Egyptians will hear about it. For you, for by your strength, you brought up this people from, from them. They will tell it to the inhabitants of, of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, or among these people, how you, Lord, are seen face to face, how your clouds stand over them and how you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. If you kill this people with a single blow, the nations that have heard of your fame will declare. Since the Lord wasn't able to bring this people into the land he swore to give to them, he has slaughtered them in the wilderness. So now may my Lord's power be magnified just as, just as, as you have spoken. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, forgiving iniquity and rebellion. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generation. We've heard that before. He says, verse 19, please pardon the iniquity of the people in keeping with the greatness of your faithful, faithful love for just as you have forgiven them from Egypt until now. The Lord responded, I have pardoned them as you requested, yet as surely as I live and as the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me will never see the land I swore to give to their fathers. But since my servant Caleb has a different spirit, and has remained loyal to me. So there's your difference here. There's despise, there's being there's despising God, there's not trusting God, there's not obeying God from the side of, from this side of the people. He says, But Caleb's different, he has remained loyal to me. Because of that, verse 24, I will bring him into the land where he has gone, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the lowlands, turn back tomorrow and head for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. And then Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, how long must I endure this evil community that keeps complaining about me? There's another one. I have heard the Israelites complaints that they have made against me. Tell them as surely as I live, this is the Lord's declaration. I will do to you exactly as I heard you say. Your corpses will fall in the wilderness. All of you who are registered in the census, the entire number of you 20 years old or more, because you have complained about me, I swear that none of you will enter the land I promised to, set, to settle you in, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. I will bring your children, whom you said will become plunder, into the land you rejected, and they will enjoy it. But as for you, you, your corpses will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the penalty of your acts of unfaithfulness until all your corpses lie scattered in the wilderness you will bear the consequences of your iniquities 40 years based on the number of the 40 days that you scouted the land, a year for each day. You will know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. I swear that I will do this to the entire evil community that has conspired against me. They will come to an end in the wilderness, and there they will die. So the men Moses sent to scout out the land and who returned and incited the entire community to complain about him by spreading a negative report about the land. Those who had spread the negative report about the land were struck down by the Lord. Only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, remained alive of those men who went to scout out the land. There's a lot that happens here in these 30 some odd verses. We see the Lord going from done with the people going to restart with you, Moses, which is which would be him becoming the new Abraham in a sense. I'm going to restart with you. We have Moses pleading for the people and the Lord listening to Moses. And yet, even within the, the pleading and the intercession that Moses makes for the people here, which in a sense makes him a, a Christ-like figure, being that, inter, that interceder for, for them, that intercessor for them, uh, even within that, he says, listen, you're going to hold people accountable for their sins. 
which is exactly what the Lord says. Those who have participated in this and those who went along with it, 20 years or 21 years and up, you're going to stay in the wilderness. What you said was going to happen, I'm going to make sure happens. But your sons and your, your children, they're going to be the ones that get to go in and enjoy it. Uh, I can't blame the Lord for his initial response, but I can appreciate Moses and, and his, his mind seeing a better way for the Lord to go about this. Not to say that the way that the Lord was going about it was the wrong way. The Lord has every right to do what he says. But you see here this, this intimate relationship between the Lord and Moses and the fact that they can talk back and forth and they do reason in a sense with one another uh, to, to do what is best for the people, at least from Moses' perspective, which the Lord confirms as being correct. What's so ironic here is, uh, you know, Moses' faith versus the uh, Moses' understanding of God versus the Israelite, the people's faith and understanding. You know, the people were worried that they would not be strong enough to, you know, take the land, that the Lord would not be able to strike them down. Whereas Moses understands that the Lord, I mean, verse 15, if you kill this people with a single blow, like it's, it's not going to be hard for the, for the Lord to just, you know, wipe them out literally in a single blow, one snap of his fingers or whatever. I mean, this is, uh, so he under, he's the one that understands the might and power of the Lord. And uh, again, this is similar to the, uh, the time with the, in Exodus 32 with the golden calf. I mean, uh, the Lord was ready to, to wipe them out right there. And, and Moses just appeals to uh, to the Lord and his and his goodness, his uh, his faithful love, his his mercy, uh, his his pardon, um, his forgiveness. He talks about all these things, and and like you mentioned, he he doesn't he doesn't try to uh, he doesn't try to to appeal to the to God to to not be just, but he you know he just he's he's begging for forgiveness for uh for this people and uh i, I kind of wonder here like i guess th this this part happens before the pronouncement of the 40 years but um you know does moses know that because of this he's gonna have to wander with his people for 40 more years <laughs> and uh I, I I guess not. Uh, later on, like in Deuteronomy, like Moses is kind of you, you can tell he's kind of a little snarky about stuff. He's like, you know, he he just had he was for him he should have had that last forty years of his life, uh, you know, eating grapes and Hebron, you know, yeah. in the middle of a conquered land or at least the Jewish last, retirement. He should have had that retirement, and this is uh, it gets taken from him. So, um, you know if the first time wasn't uh wasn't a kind of a, a test enough you know at least this time maybe moses is thinking you know what i'm kind of you know i've had these people for a year and a half and uh you know they're terrible so maybe this wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to just wipe them out and start over but <laughs> uh but moses being a you know a good man you know still uh intercedes for for the people and you know as a good intercessor does so uh, so props to him here and and the Lord, you know, he immediately verse 20, I have pardoned them as you have requested. So uh, I, I love times like this. I think of when David finally admits his sin and the Lord is, you know, quick to forgive it. Um, same thing here. I, you know, he forgives them. Yet verse 21. I will be glorified, you know the Lord will forgive, but the Lord will be uh, glorified in this. And, and the, you know, the, the guilty ones will be, will be destroyed. The 10, the 10 spies were, were destroyed. And then, you know, he pronounces this 40 years of judgment on the people, which I find, I love, uh, I've never noticed how often uh, the punishments uh, against people so 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 cleanly complaint. fit the cl the yeah. crime or you know uh, somebody sins they're they're trying to have something happen so like in the tower of babel they were trying to you know not be scattered and they were trying to reach to you know reach to the heavens well they're because of their they were trying to do that against the will of god then what does he do he scatters them yep. and their their tower remains unbuilt so you know when you're trying to do something 
against the will of God, usually the thing you're trying to avoid ends up happening to you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he mentions that here, you know, you were trying to not die in the wilderness and you're trying to save your children from slaughter amongst the Canaanite cities. Well, what's going to happen? You know, you're going, you are going to die in the wilderness and your children who you thought were going to be destroyed, well, they will be the ones that end up taking the land. So, uh, so it's really, I, I love the irony. I love the, uh, the justness of what happens here with, with the people. And, and that's just a testament to, to the Lord's justness, that, that he is going to be just in everything that he does. And um, it's good to see at least that one person was listening to to what what the Lord said back in Exodus 20, whenever the law was given out. You know, he was talking about, I believe it was the third, the third command uh, about the uh, making, uh, let's see here, I guess second, third, depending on how you count it. Uh, in verses three and th three, four and five, he says, verse five, do not worship them. I think talking about the idols that they can make for themselves, do not serve them for thou the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the father's iniquity to the third and four generations. That's exactly what, what the, the Lord says here. He says, but, or what Moses says there, uh, punishing to the third or fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to the thousand generations, those who love me and keep my commandments. There Moses is, is using, I don't want to say using God's words against him. He's not using God's words against him, but he is acknowledging what the Lord has already said. And listen, you're, you're faithful in your love for us and, and your kindness and your compassion. And I know that you have to punish those who are, who are evil and wicked, but uh, forgiveness is still there. And the punishment that is given here is that the children are going to have to wonder. That's what we see in verse 33, that your children will be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the penalty for your acts of unfaithfulness. And then the punishment would be, would be exacted upon them and the fact that they would die in the wilderness. They would never be able to enter into this land that had been promised to them because of their unfaithfulness. Remember, the promises given were contingent on faithfulness. If they would be faithful to the Lord, they would enjoy these things. But if they would not be faithful, if they broke the covenant, the covenant commands, then they would incur curses, which is what we're seeing here. This curse of not being able to enter the land. Uh, but to me, it's so interesting seeing the people's response that they're so hard hearted and they're so rebellious. They despise the Lord so much. They don't want to listen to him. But yet now, whenever their backs are really against the wall and they're, they're hearing, okay, I guess we're going to not going to get what, what we really want, which is just rest. Rest is what they're looking forward to. Um, the people, they're overcome with grief. In verse 39, when Moses reported these words to all the Israelites, people were overcome with grief. They got up early the next morning and went up to the ridge of the hill country saying, let's go to the place the Lord has promised for we were wrong. You know, you know, our bad. We, we, we should have listened. We're good to go now. Now we'll trust you. Let, let's go do what we need to do. But Moses responded, why are you going against the Lord's command? It won't succeed. Remember, he had given them another, a new command now. Their command originally had, had been to go to the promised land. But once they had rejected that, now there's a new command. The new command is found back in verse 25, that now the command is to turn back tomorrow and head for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. So you need to go back the other direction. They are going against this command again in verse number 40. And verse 41 says, why are you going against the Lord's command? It won't succeed. Don't go because the Lord is not among you. He was. He was among you, but now he's not. And you will be defeated by your enemies. The Amalekites and Canaanites are right in front of you, and you will fall by the sword. The Lord won't be with you since you have turned from following him. But they dared. I like that language there. But they dared to go up the ridge of the, Lord, of the hill country, even though the ark of the Lord's covenant and Moses did not leave the camp. Then the Amalekites, the Canaanites who lived in that part of the hill country came down, attacked them, and routed them as far as Horma. The people, just as the Lord said, they're a stubborn and rebellious people. Even though in their mind, they're saying, okay, okay, I guess, you know, going into this land is going to be better than wandering in the wilderness and dying. We choose this instead, but it's too late. It's too late. And that's a lesson for us to learn sometimes. Maybe there are points where we make mistakes that it's too far to, it, we've gone too far to turn around and not, not experience the consequences. Sometimes we have to experience the consequences for what we've done. 
here the people were going to have to experience the consequences for what they had done. That didn't mean that they were so guilty. I mean, we see that God had pardoned them, but they still couldn't go in. And yet here, very quickly, we see them rebelling again. And it leads to some of them being killed in this, this instance, Alan. Uh, to me, what stands out to me is the language here. What he says in verse 4, the Lord is not among you. Verse 43, the Lord won't be with you. And then in verse 44, the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and, the Mo and Moses didn't leave the camp. They tried to do this to begin with. Originally, which is funny, originally they weren't willing to do it with the Lord's help. And now they're turning around. They're trying to do it without the Lord's help. They just can't figure out the right thing to do. Verse 40 kind of makes me laugh. That, that phrase, you know, they got up early the next morning. Um, we see when, whenever that phrase is used, it's usually it's emphasizing the, uh, the immediacy of something happening. The, uh, it's the emphasis on, you know, how, how important it is. So more often than not, this is a positive time. You know, mm -hmm. Abraham gets up early to offer sacrifices or, you know, early in the morning, some of the Psalms say, I will praise your name. You know, this is, uh, you know, you purposefully, you, you want to start your day doing something good and positive and right. Well, when we use it here, they were starting their day. They, I mean, they had, they couldn't wait any longer. They were wanting to, they were daring to do wrong so much that they got up early to do it. Like that's, that's, I think that's the mindset that they, uh, that we're supposed to see here. This wasn't just like, okay, um, well, maybe, maybe if we go up, we'll, uh, and fight, then maybe the Lord will win. And then maybe he won't be so mad with us after all. This was a very purposeful um, continuation in their, in their rebellion, really. Because mm -hmm. like you mentioned, I mean, there's a new commandment. This is, you know, before the Lord said, go up and attack. Well, now the Lord had just said, you know, turn around, uh, go back here. 25. Uh, yeah. Verse 25. Where was that? Yep. So, I mean, turn back tomorrow and head for the wilderness right there in the direction of the Red Sea. So they've already rebelled once against the, against the command of the Lord. So the situation's changed. The Lord gives them a new command. And what do they do? Again, they do the exact opposite of that. And, you know, early in the morning, tomorrow, I mean, they are, they are so quick and so eager to go against the word of the Lord um, just time and time again. And it's, it's sad. And I mean, it's definitely a warning against us to not be the same way. I mean, how often do we, uh, do we reject the word of the Lord? Do we get up early to do something <laughs> do something against the word of the Lord. That's, uh, that's what they were doing here. It's just, I mean, it's funny, but it's also just, uh, you just can't help but shake your head against this generation. There's a proverb, Alan, that would fit very well with this, with this people and this generation, as you just mentioned, and it is Proverbs 14 and verse number 12, which states that there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. That, to me, would be something that they would have done well to uh, put in their little head phylacteries so that it literally was between their eyes at all points. To remember that just because it seems right to me doesn't mean it's right, especially if it goes against something that the Lord has stated here. We see them. What <laughs> It's almost whatever the Lord says. We're going to do something different. We're, we're going to do something different. And it is a, a sad testament to the deceitful heart of men and our need to make sure that we are listening to the word of the Lord and we are putting our confidence in his word and trusting in him, knowing that his ways are higher than our ways. His knowledge is greater than our knowledge. He knows what is right whenever we so often do not. And we would do well. And we really do ourselves a favor, in fact, to just listen to what he says and obey him, trusting him, having that believing loyalty. Going back to, to Exodus 20, believe that I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And if you believe that and if you want to display your loyalty, this is how you can do it. 
The same thing is true for us today. If we believe that our God is the God of creation, if we believe that he sent his son to die for us, so that, so that believing and trusting in him and obeying his, his word, we might have salvation, then we would do well to, to do everything that he says and, and, and do those things to show our trust and belief in his commandments. Alan, these words, as we say, stand as a testament uh, for us to learn from so we don't make similar, similar mistakes. What do you have to share with us to close us out for this Friday afternoon? Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to look at my schedule here to see what we had coming up for next week. I think we're jumping, skipping vert chapter 15. Yeah, we've still, we've actually still got one more rebellion to discuss. That's going to be Korah's, mm-hmm. Korah's rebellion in uh, chapter 16, which is where we'll cover a week from now, 16. And, and then uh, 17 is going to be uh, kind of a, kind of the ending part of that. So, uh, you would think at this point the people finally learn their lesson. You know, they accept their punishment, but they're Don't still rebel against God. It's that simple. <laughs> Do what He says. So there's there's still going to be more more rebellion by uh, by a different set of people, the Levites this time. Uh, so that's going to be a a different a different story coming up on uh, on next Tuesday. Right. We do look forward to studying that together with you. If you have any questions or comments about what we have studied today, please feel free to reach out to us here on the Pleasant Plains uh, Church of Christ Facebook page. If you're on Facebook or forever on YouTube, please feel free to hop over there to Facebook and look us up. Or if you don't have a Facebook account, our website is armorofgodonline.com, armorofgodonline.com, where you could just Google search Pleasant Plains Church of Christ in Jackson, Tennessee, and you will find us there. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to, to talk with you about those things. And if you're looking for a church to worship with this Sunday, Lord willing and weather permitting, we'll be meeting together on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. in our parking lot. Please feel free to come in and find a parking space and remain in your vehicles. Or if you'd like to get out and sit with some of us on, on the parking lot surface, we'll have some chairs set up. We'll be getting there as early as we can to congregate in the shade or if you'd like to bring a tent bring a tent to set up that you can set under that'll be just fine that will be completely completely okay we want to be as comfortable as we can be as we come together to worship god and we're thankful for the provisions that he's given us in in that way right now we'll be studying from mark chapter 7 and i believe the verses is verses 1 through 23 where we'll talk about jesus desiring a pure heart He wants us to serve him and to seek after him with a pure heart. We're going to look at that in that text. Hope you can join us then. If not, we will be here on Facebook and YouTube. At least that is the plan. So long as technology cooperates with us. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you as always to Alan for his good, good help in leading us in some great thoughts in this study. Uh, We're so thankful to be able to do this with you. And we look forward to continuing to do this on Tuesdays. Moving forward, as we continue to walk through the story of the Bible that we believe is history, but not only is it history, but it's his story given to us so that we can know why we are where we are today and what his will for us is through Jesus. God bless you in all that you do. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.